Good morning, Bethel. Won't you stand to your feet? We're going to worship our King. Hallelujah. you have made whatever comes I won't complain for all my hope is in your name and now your joy awaits my praise yeah. I give thanks for all you have done and I will sing of your mercy and your love your love is Set my feet on higher ground So here I stand You are my God Your faithfulness My solid rock I give thanks for all you have done And I will sing of your mercy and your love Your love is unfailing Lord, I
the day we get to gather and let our praises fill the air where we can join with heaven's song that's always going and lift up the name of Jesus. So we're so glad you came to join with us today. And this morning, I've just had the thought or the, the word surrender on my heart that the past 24 hours or so. This morning, as you're walking into this place, I want you to encourage, or I want to encourage you to surrender yourself to him this morning. Surrender your circumstance, surrender whatever you've got going on, surrender more of you so that he can fill you and his spirit can be powerful and move in your heart. Jesus, this morning we focus on you and all that you have, that your Holy Spirit would infiltrate us and would move through us, Lord. We love you and we worship you in your name. Amen. Thank you, Jesus.
death had claimed its victory The king of love had given up his life The darkest day in history There on the cross they made for sinners For every curse his blood atoned Final breath and it was finished But not the end we could have known For the earth began to shake And the veil was torn What sacrifice was made As the heaven
my Savior King Your loving kindness has welcomed me Though I'm unworthy of majesty You wrap the lowly in royalty
it's your breath in our lives. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lives. So we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath in our lives. So we pour. this morning this morning we're going to partake in communion and we just want to go into this with an attitude of of thankfulness and gratefulness it's all for him and we give it all to you Jesus we'll ask our ushers to come at this time and if you did not receive the elements when you came in you can just slip up your hand And if you are here this morning and you have put your faith in Jesus Christ for your salvation, he says, do this, do this in remembrance of me. So I want to make sure everybody has the opportunity to partake of communion with us this morning. Scripture tells us on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take ye for this is my body, which is broken for you. Let's partake of the body of Christ together this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your sacrifice. On the same night, he took the cup, and after he blessed it, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take drink. This cup is my blood, the blood of the new covenant. Scripture tells us that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness for our sins. It's only because of the blood of Jesus, because of his sacrifice, that you and I can not only be forgiven, but we can also be restored to a relationship with God, our Heavenly Father. It's all because of the sacrifice of Jesus. Would you hold that cup up with me this morning? Lord Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your body that was broken. Thank you for your perfect blood that was shed, not for your sins, but for mine, for ours. Lord, thank you that you became our sacrifice. You indeed paid the price so that we could have our sins forgiven, so that we could have a relationship with the Father. Lord, we thank you. We remember your sacrifice this morning. Let's partake of the cup. Thank you, Jesus. Give him praise, church. Thank you, Lord. Don't 
will cry, these bones will sing. Shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great. To us, we turn it back to your praise. Everything that you've blessed our lives with, we give it back to you to honor you, to glorify you. Father, this morning we surrender ourselves to you. We just surrender our, our circumstances, Father, what we're struggling with, we surrender it to you. For great are you, Lord. There is none like you. We pour it out. It's your breath in my lungs. So I'll pour out my praise. I'll pour out. Come on, personalize it. It's your breath in my lungs. So I'll pour out my praise to you all. It's your breath in my lungs, so I'll pour out my praise, I'll pour out my praise. It's your breath in my lungs, so I'll pour out my praise to you only.
Jesus, with everything that we have, we turn it back to you. Thank you for meeting us here. Thank you for your presence that never leaves. We worship you in this place in your name. Amen. You may be seated. so happy that you decided to join us today. On your way in, you received a bulletin, and on the bottom of that bulletin is a connection card. We ask that you fill that out with as much or as little information as you're comfortable with, and place it in the buckets located in the back of the sanctuary. In addition, we have QR codes that you can please scan to fill out our online connection card. For our first time guests, please stop by the welcome desk to receive a gift just for you. Hey church, Pastor Steve here, and I want to take this opportunity to invite you out to our starting point classes. Our starting point classes are really geared for those who are newer to the church or those who are looking to get more involved, and even for those who are looking into official church membership. So whether you're looking to find out more about what we believe or you're looking for a place to serve, starting point is the place for you. Here at Bethel, we love celebrating our graduates. So we have a graduation Sunday coming up in June, but we want to make sure that we celebrate all of our high school graduates. So if you know of any high school graduates that are here at Bethel, please let us know by emailing us at office at Bethelfullgospel.com. It's time again for the Bethel Full Gospel Annual Church Picnic. This year, it's going to be held on Saturday, June 22nd at 11 a.m., at Tower Center Park in Gilderland, New York. Bring the whole family, but before you do, go to the Church Center app and put in there how many people you'll be bringing and also what kind of food or drink you're gonna be bringing. This is the opportunity that we all get to sit down and break physical bread together. We look forward to meeting you. We look forward to talking with you. We looking forward to fellowshipping with you. God bless you. It is time for Mega Sports Camp, July 22nd through the 25th. We will be having Mega Sports Camp here at Bethel. It is a chance for the kids to come and learn a new sport, get better at a sport. We have basketball, soccer, classic sports. New this year, we have baseball. We also have Mega Minis and a non-sport option of cooking and crafts. Sign up your kids today. Invite the kids from your community. We want it to be a great time for everyone. You can sign up right on our Church Center app. Also, if you'd like to volunteer, if you're good at a sport or you would just like to volunteer in any capacity, you can also sign up on the Church Center app. We hope to see you at Mega Sports Camp. There are four easy ways to give at Bethel Full Gospel. One, you can go to the website at BethelFullGospel.com. Two, you can use the Church Center app. Three, you can send a check to 3669 Gilderland Avenue, Schenectady 12306, or you can put your offerings in the buckets at the back of the sanctuary. Thank you very much. God loves a cheerful giver. Good morning, church. Thank you for coming out to worship with us today. Beautiful Sunday. It is June. All the cool people have birthdays in June. You know who you are, right? No, there's no June birthdays here. Are you kidding me? There's a bunch on staff. So just so you know. So a couple weeks ago, we celebrated Pentecost Sunday. And uh, to highlight it, we are taking a Pentecost Sunday offering to help plant churches. Pentecost, in addition to the arrival of the Holy Spirit, is widely recognized as the birth of the church, uh, the idea of the, the gathering of Christ followers. And we have been working with the Timothy Initiative for the last several years, and we've taken this offering twice in the past. Both times, over $20,000 came in to help plant churches. Well, I got a text this week from the director, David Nelms, and he's telling us a little bit about what was going 
going on and what is going on with TTI and with their efforts to plant churches. So I want you to look at this picture up here on the screen. I'm going to read the text to you quickly. It says, I was in Togo recently and we prayer walked a red village. Now a red village is a village that has no churches and no Christ followers. Everyone there are voodoo worshipers. Our prayer was for a person of peace that we could start a new fellowship with. So when they enter a new village, they look for someone, anyone, who will be receptive to their message. Well, the Lord opened the door. We found a man who had been having dreams about Jesus, but didn't know anything about him. So our first service was this week. He brought his two sons and a friend. And I pray that many souls will enter the kingdom from there soon. Thank you for helping to make this happen. I absolutely love that even before we can get to them, Jesus starts speaking to hearts. Uh, and that's what we see going on here. So your giving towards this Pentecost offering is going to plant churches in places where maybe the only thing they've heard about Jesus was a dream where the Holy Spirit begins to speak to them. So please give and give generously. And uh, I look forward to sharing with you how much comes in. I'll announce it one more week and then we'll, we'll send the offering off. But we're excited about the work there with the Timothy Initiative. So this morning, uh, I want to share with you a sermon title digging deep, a sermon about endurance, a sermon about endurance, the importance for you and I of staying the course, of sticking to it, even when it's difficult, even when it's hard. And we know there's times in life it's difficult and it's hard. When I talk about endurance, I think about high school sports and Every sport you played, you had to be in good shape, right? Except golf. Golf, you could just be, I don't know, lazy. But anyway, you had to be in good shape. Play football, wrestle, basketball, soccer, whatever sport you played in high school. Uh, you had to be in good shape. So there was a part of every practice that was just devoted, dedicated to conditioning. Building your endurance. And I remember football, there was that portion of practice where you just run. That was it. You don't carry a ball, no, just full pads, just run. And we would run like around the whole stadium and come back like, this is terrible. Wrestling was in the winter, so we were indoors. We would run around the school inside, run through the hallways. Only time you were allowed to run in the hallways. Just run in laps because our school was kind of a big square. It just, that was the worst part of every sport it was just running. It was gonna run now. Hey guys, you know, practice is almost done, let's run. Basketball, it was sprints. <sighs> like, stop. And then, apparently, there's this other sport, all you do is run. <laughs> like, you take the worst part of practice from every sport, and that's all they do. It's called track. Oh my gosh, who does that? That's terrible. All we're going to do is run, like just run. And then when we're done, we're going to run hills, and I'm out. I'm done. When I think of endurance, I think about some of those days and running, and oh my gosh, it was terrible. But it's more than just physical uh, endurance. We also know there's endurance going through situations in life when it's difficult, when things are hard. I don't think we need a show of hands here. Everyone's been through hard situations in your home, in your family, maybe a health situation. And there's, there's situations there where we need endurance to get through the season that we're in. And of course, and what I'm going to talk about the most today is enduring spiritually. Because certainly we can start the race, but Paul talks about finishing the race. And that's the analogy that scripture uses. It's a race. And we're called to finish and finish well. Paul says run to win. So talking about enduring in that spiritual race. The definition of endurance or endure is to continue in the same state, not to quit, but to continue, to remain firm under suffering or misfortune without 
yielding. I like that. To remain firm under suffering. Uh, I want to share with you a story of endurance. A story of endurance from Genesis chapter 26. So in this, we finished up Exodus. We're, we're, we're backing up doing some other stuff now. Uh, we have Abraham. Abraham's considered the father of the Jewish faith. Father Abraham, many sons, da, 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 you know the thing. So he, he was the one that God promised, I will make your descendants as, as numerous as the sand on the seashore, as numerous as the stars in the sky. Well, Isaac's old, doesn't have a son, and eventually God gives him Isaac, and Isaac becomes that child of promise. And in Genesis 26, Abraham has passed, and we have Isaac here, and he's going to teach us a little something about endurance. So I'm going to read today New King James, Genesis 26, starting in verse 17. Then Isaac departed from there, and he pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. And Isaac dug again the wells of water which they had dug in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. And he called them by the names which his father had called them. Also Isaac's servants dug in the valley, and they found a well of running water there. But the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen and said, The water's ours. So he called the name of the well Isaac, because they quarreled with him. Verse 21 says, Then they dug another well, and they quarreled over that one also. So he called its name Sitna. And he moved from there to dig another well. And when they did not quarrel over it, he called the name of it Rehoboth. Because he said, for now the Lord has made room for us and we shall be fruitful in the land. So wells in ancient times, no different than today. The need for water is essential. Uh, and for these tribesmen and for those who were living in the plains to have access to water was absolutely uh, of top importance, not only for your survival, but it was the watering of your flocks and taking care of your family. So wells were a big deal. And they couldn't call the local contractor to come in with his drill rig or his excavator and just like, no. They dug wells by hand. For service, I'm like, Is it, have any of you ever dug a well before by hand? We had a guy. He's like, yes, I have. I'm like, you poor man. Anybody here? Anybody dig a well by hand? Anyone? I won't make fun of you too much. No? All right. Like, if you think that sounds awful, you would be correct. <laughs> that was brutal. And listen to this. Now, Abraham dug these wells for water, and his enemies, the Philistines, went and filled the wells back in. So Isaac is redoing the work here. He's redoing the job that his father had done so many years earlier. And this is a powerful illustration for us in the spiritual life. Because we have those who have come before us that have laid a foundation They've dug some deep wells. How many of you are here this morning and you are thankful for a mother who prayed? How many of you are here today, you're thankful for a father, maybe a grandfather, an uncle, someone who prayed for you? They were digging deep wells for you. And now you realize, as an adult, you have to continue to dig those deep wells. You have to continue to put in the work. And that's a little bit of what we'll talk about this morning. So Isaac here is doing the work for himself now that his father had already laid the foundation of. And he calls the wells by three different names, and each of them kind of have a meaning for us. And we're going to look at those, and then I want to look at four verses from the New Testament that talk about endurance and hanging in there, even if it means digging deep wells. So the name of the first well was Isaac, and that name meant contention. Contention. That first well that he had to dig was a reminder this isn't going to be easy. There is going to be hardship. There are going to be difficulties. 
See, a lot of times as Christians, we make this mistake. A lot of times as followers of Christ, when something gets difficult, we immediately think God's not in it. As soon as it gets hard, we're like, oh, well, this can't be of God. And maybe we, we grab some verses, probably out of context. Oh, well, God's got a peace. I have no peace, so can't be doing this. And as soon as something's hard, many Christians quit and they avoid it and they detour around it. But I want you to know God is with us right in the middle of adversity. God doesn't leave us when things are hard, right? Right? So we find out here this first well is contention. That means it's going to be hard, it's going to be difficult. But hear me this morning, believer, even in the difficult seasons, God is there. He is with you. No quitting. No quitting. He goes on, he calls the name of the second well Sitna. And that name is the name Opposition. Opposition. As Isaac is digging his wells. He's opposed by these other herdsmen saying, no, no, this is ours. You can't have this here. Even though Isaac had done all the work, they were saying, no, no, that's, that's not right. You can't do that. So listen, follower of Christ, please understand, there will be opposition to you going deeper and digging deep wells of faith in your life. There will be opposition an unbelieving world will oppose you. Sometimes those closest to you may oppose you. Jesus told his disciples that you will be hated by everyone because of me. He said, they hated me, they're going to hate you. If you are living your life as a Christian trying to be loved by everyone, that's not going to work. Sell ice cream. Everyone loves ice cream. <laughs> Stand up for the faith. You are not going to be loved. Isaac calls this well opposition because he knows that there was opposition to what he was doing. And as followers of Jesus, we know there is going to be opposition. There will be people who are not in favor of you standing for Christ. Had a thing happen this morning where my daughter left the house. She opened the front door, and it's like the, we've had like a couple beautiful sunny days, right? And the sun just kind of just shot in the door, and I still kind of had morning eyes, right? You've been there? And I was like, bright light, and you're, oh, my, like, shut the door. What are you doing? Uh, it was one of those things, hadn't had the coffee yet, just kind of like early. And, and that brightness shines, and your eyes aren't ready for it, and that's how you respond. And that is exactly what is happening in the spiritual. As the light of Jesus is shining through you, there is a world. There, there are some of your family members. There are some close loved ones. There are some friends who are seeing that light of Jesus, and they don't like it. They're not ready for it. Their eyes have not adjusted. We prepare ourselves for opposition when we're serving the Lord, when we're serving God. We have one more well, the final well he called Rehoboth. And that well, the, the interpretation for that is roominess. He says, the Lord has made room for us and we shall be fruitful in the land. Spacious. Vast, abundance, more than enough. These are the promises of God for his children. For those who follow him, God promises you'll have everything you need. I'm going to take care of you as you follow me. So we have these three wells. And the heart behind it was he was going to have to work hard. It was not going to be easy. Digging the wells. It was hand tools. It was shovels and sticks. And they were breaking up dirt and they were doing whatever they could. And they had to go deep. It wasn't, they couldn't dig for five minutes and stop and say, oh, this is enough. And sometimes that's what our spiritual looks like. Our, our spiritual life looks like we, we dug into God for five minutes and then we stopped. We said, hey, this is getting hard. 
There's, there's a lot of rocks in the soil here. There, there are a lot of things that need to be broken up and addressed and things that I need to deal with. They kept digging. And what do we see here at the end? He saw that these wells weren't just the result of hard work, but it was the blessing of God on him. As he was digging, God was blessing. And there's something about that relationship. There's something about you and I doing our best and digging and working hard and the blessing of God coming upon it. It doesn't work separated. It doesn't mean we work hard and do whatever we want and just ask God to bless it. No, 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 no. It's doing what God wants. It also doesn't mean we just sit back with our arms crossed and say, God bless me. God, I went to church this week, so just bless me. Send blessings. There is something about the working for the Lord in conjunction with the blessing of God. It's not all the work of man, and it's not only the work of God. It's the two working together. Your growth in your faith is going to be the combination of you digging deep wells. And as you do that, God is going to pour out his blessings and his guidance and his love and his joy and his peace. And he's going to build you into the man of God, the woman of God that he's called you to be. It's your part. And we know God always does his part. Proverbs 10.22 says this, the blessing of the Lord makes one rich and he adds no sorrow with it. He adds no sorrow with it. When it's God's thing, it's truly blessed. When it's your thing, nah, hit or miss. You might, you might be in for some trouble. But when it's God's thing, he adds no sorrow with it. Digging holes. Anybody like to dig holes? I hate digging holes. These are pastor's hands. They are soft. They work at it. There's a couple, couple calluses from the golf club. That's it. That's it, folks. These can be in commercials, all right? It's palm olive. You're soaking in it, all right? So when we bought our house, we had to build a fence, and I had to dig. It gets worse. The fence was for the dogs. <laughs> just let him out, and we'll just leave it to chance, Right? Like, if the Lord brings him back, he wants us to have him. So one of the first things we do in this new house, I'm building a fence for dogs. So I go to Pastor Dave's, and I borrow his post hole digger. And I gave it back within two to three years. He got it back. And I got his post hole digger, and I'm in the yard. And, you know, I hit that first one, and you pull it together. And I, I lifted out a lot. of. I'm like, this is going to be easy. This isn't so bad. Even my hands could do this. I do the second one, and immediately it's like, rock. <laughs> like, the second swing, rock. And then I realized, like, the whole neighborhood is red clay and shale. I'm like, this stinks. This is the worst. And it took days. I had to do, like, ten holes, and you're not supposed to go four feet deep because we're in New York, and I'm like, whatever. <laughs> it's a dog fence. I don't care if they get out. So, like... The first hole's like four feet. The second one was like three, nine. The third one, three and a half. By the end, we're like one. That's good. <laughs> we're set. We're set. That is hard work. And this is what Isaac was doing. This is where he's digging these wells. And, and, and it was hard work. And here's the thing, church. I want you to hear this today. We don't hear enough about hard work. We don't hear enough about digging deep wells. We hear about blessings, forgiveness, grace, joy, rainbows and unicorns and all of the favor of God. And listen, I'm a big fan of the favor of God, but you know what? We have to understand the work that is involved. And we can't be afraid of the work 
and we can't try to do a detour or a bypass every time it gets hard or it gets difficult. Sometimes you just have to pick up your shovel and you have to dig deeper wells so that you get that living water, so that you tap in to God. So endurance becomes key. You don't get to quit in five minutes. You have to keep going. So I want to look at a few verses today that highlight the importance of endurance and perseverance. We don't want to quit too easy. We don't want to quit our jobs. We don't want to quit on our dreams. We don't quit on our marriages. We don't quit on our children. We don't give up. We don't surrender. People give up on church. They give up on their faith. They give up on people. People give up on themselves. This is about perseverance. This is what the Word of God tells us. First verse I'll give you is Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, I read as follows. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. I want you to follow the, the thinking here. Tribulation, trials, hardships, produce perseverance. And perseverance or endurance produces character. A couple times in my life I've taken up jogging or running or whatever, you know, health benefits, you're supposed to do it, blah, 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 whatever. And I would go out and you remember like if you've ever done this the first time you went out running and you hadn't been running in a while and you're like, let's get a mile without stopping. Or you're like, let's get around the block without stopping. Like, let's get the mail <laughs> without, or whatever. I just get to the end of the driveway. Um, and, and that first, like, you start running and muscles you didn't know you had, like right under your rib, begin to cramp and spasm, and you can't breathe or stand up. And you're like, what is, I think I've been stabbed. What is happening? This is, I can't run, I'm gonna be stabbed. This is terrible. And, and then you're like, oh, but I did it, I made it, I, I did the block, and then you stop and you walk for a little bit, and then you, you try to, and then each day, you know, you're kind of building on that, and then you remember, you get the first mile down, and you hadn't stopped, and you feel like you're on top of the world, you're like, oh, I can do this, and then you're doing 5Ks, you're, what is that, 3.1, whatever, and, and it feels good, and you've persevered through the pain, through the hardship. You've accomplished something, and now you're feeling a little better. You're feeling a little stronger, a little more confident. And the started as tribulation, but it gave way to perseverance, and it produced character. And this is what God does in our life. The hardships in your life, and I know everyone here lives perfect lives with no hardship. The hardship in your life is God giving you an opportunity to persevere, to endure. And as you do that, God is going to build his character into your life. God is very interested in your character. God has a great investment in your, in fact, he invested your, his son in you developing the character of Christ, the godliness of Christ, the, the fruits of the spirit in our life. And every time we're faced with adversity, every time we're faced with a difficult situation, every time your spouse makes you angry, your boss drives you nuts, your kids make you want to strangle them, and not really strangle them because we don't strangle kids, but we think it. Think about it. Uh, you know what I mean? Every one of those opportunities at the workplace, at home, in the neighborhood, every one of them is an opportunity for you to keep the faith, keep making the right decisions, fight against the temptations, serve God, dig deep. Perseverance develops character. I love this definition of character. Character is who you are when no one else is looking, when no one else is around. Your spouse isn't there, your friends aren't there, your church isn't there. It's just you 
and God. Character is who you are when no one else is around. And God is deeply interested in you developing the character of Christ. So what does he do? He allows some tribulations. He allows some difficulty. And what do you do? You run from difficulty and tribulation. But God wants you to have character. So what does God do? He brings you a little bit more. And then you're like, no, I'm going to keep running. And he's like, no, I'm going to develop my character in you. And it becomes this circle. Persevere. Endure. Don't quit. Do it God's way. Allow him to build that character in our lives. Next one is Hebrews 12.1, and it says this. And let me give you the background. Hebrews 11, Faith Hall of Fame. Hebrews 11 rattles off 30 names of different heroes of the faith. I don't know how many names, 30, 40, 20, I don't know. Bunch of them. And it tells us all of their exploits and what they did for the faith and, and how they honored God and how they overcame difficult situation. Like the end of Hebrews 11 says, like, and some were fed to lions and sawn in two, like with a saw, hello, and they kept the faith. So this whole list of Christ followers from, from Bible times, those who are faithful to God even through adversity. And then Hebrews 12.1 says this, therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Hebrews 12.1 paints this incredible image of the saints of heaven and your loved ones who have gone on in Jesus and they are in heaven and they are up there cheering you on. They're up there, and you're like, oh, I'm so tired. And they're like, no, you got this. The Apostle Paul is like, you can do it. Let's go. David, Moses, Noah, your loved ones, they're like, hang in there. Relief is coming. Keep going. We're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, examples to us of perseverance. And then the verse gives us two keys, two very important keys to endure. The first one. Lay aside every sin. Get rid of it. Get rid of every obstacle, every sin, every weight that so easily besets us, as the King James. It takes us off course. Scripture says if you're going to endure, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Second key, and keep your eyes on Jesus. Calls him the author the one who originated, and the finisher of our faith. Another translation calls him the author and perfecter of our faith. The word of God says, he that began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Jesus, keep your eyes on Jesus, the one who got you started and the one who's going to see you through. That is how we endure. We have all the saints of heaven cheering us on, and we keep our eyes on Jesus. Galatians 6.9 gives us this. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. In due season. So the example here of in due season and reaping, it's, it's a farming kind of analogy. The farmer understands that if, if he plants his seeds in the spring and he works hard in the summer, in the fall, he's going to have a crop and that crop will sustain him through the winter. Very farming. In due season, will reap rewards. This becomes such a critical moment for a follower of Jesus or maybe a potential follower of Jesus. That moment when you have to make a decision, is the investment now worth the hard work? Is, is what I'm going through now, is it worth it to stick with Jesus in the end, or should I just give up and throw in the towel? And scripture tells us, in due 
season, you will reap a reward. The promise of God, I'm not like a prosperity guy, you know that, but I'm a big fan in God rewarding faithfulness. I think that's a good thing. And God promises us. He promises those who stay faithful and stay in the race and keep running and endure. In due season, you will get that reward. And the question becomes, am I going to stick it out? Am I going to stick it out or am I going to quit early? Am I, am I, am I going to jump ship? Am I going to bail out? Or am I going to stick it out and trust that God has a reward for me? Bible shares a story where a man comes to Jesus and scripture describes him as a rich, young ruler. Rich, he had a lot of money. Young, he wasn't all old, wrinkly. And ruler, he ruled stuff. Rich, young ruler. In other words, he was better than you. <laughs> this guy came to Jesus and he thought he had everything. And he goes, Jesus, what must I do to be saved, to have eternal life? And he and Jesus have this little back and forth. And at the end, Jesus says, sell everything you have and come follow me. And the Bible tells us this man went away very sad. Never says he came back. He went away sad because he came to that critical moment where he had to make the decision, do I do the hard work now for a future reward with Jesus or should I just go my own way? Galatians says, in due season, you will reap a reward. I want you to know God doesn't miss anything. You might work hard on the job and the boss didn't notice. Someone else gets the promotion, but you've been doing all the work. You don't feel appreciated at home, at the job, with your kids, whatever. God doesn't miss a thing. And when the word of God says he will, he will reward you in due season, you can trust it. You can bank on it. Now listen, his season is not your season. His timing isn't our timing. We want the reward yesterday. We want the hardship gone. I get it, but what's God doing? He's building character. God's building us up. And I know some of you are like, I have enough character, I'm good. <laughs> this is the maximum character output you're getting, God. Let's just cool it. <laughs> There's way, I can't need that much character that these things keep happening. Right? You ever feel that way? God's working on you. His command to you, don't quit. Don't give up in do season. Some of you are here today, <clears throat> you're tired, you are exhausted, you've been fighting the same fight for a long time. Friend, in due season, God's got you. Some of you think you're at the end of your rope, you can't keep going. God is with you. Mental health is a real thing, it's a real struggle. There are people who are ready to give up, you're gi giving up on wanting to even be alive. Listen, God is with you. You will reap a reward in due season. Hang in there. Hang in there. Stay in the fight. Keep your eyes on Jesus. He's promised us this. He's promised us this. Got one more verse for you. I'll ask the worship team to come as we wind down. Verse comes out of James chapter 1, verse 12. It says, blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. The temptation to quit. The temptation to not do it God's way. The temptation to it's too difficult, so I'm out. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. What's the prize? The crown of life. Bible talks a lot about crowns in the New Testament. And in one of the examples that Paul shares, he talks about the one who runs the race to win. And when he wins, he receives a crown. And that, you know... T today you'd get like a trophy or in the Olympics you would get that, that gold medal, 
wrestlers, you get the belt. WWF, not like, not like you know, real wrestling. Uh, WWE, I'm sorry, that's how old I am. So anyway, the belt, yeah. Uh, Paul said, you got a crown. That was a reference to his day. When you win the race. And he calls the crown here, it's the crown of life. The crown of eternal life. My hope and my prayer is that for you and for me and for our loved ones, in due season is sooner than later. But even if it's not till later, the crown of life, eternity, awaits us. I don't know what your thoughts are on eternity, but I'll tell you this. This place, there's some fun stuff here. There's a lot of stuff I don't like. There's a lot of good stuff here. Since Jesus went to heaven, he says, I've been preparing a place for you. In six days, he made this, and there's some good stuff here. He's been preparing heaven ever since. No more weak physical bodies. No more being prone to sin and corruption. No more fighting the flesh. No more crying there. No more sickness. No more pain. Reunited with those loved ones who have gone before. But best of all, get to be with Jesus. We get to be with the one who we lived our lives for. Eternity awaits. And for all of our sake, I hope in due season is sooner for us. I hope, I hope the blessings of God get to show up in this life. But even if they don't, we endure. We hang on because blessed is the one who endures those temptations because when he has been approved, he will receive that crown of life, that crown of eternity with the God who loves us. And the bottom line is this, it's worth it. All of the hardship, all of the digging, the spiritual blisters that we get on our soul from all the hard work, it's worth it to be with Jesus forever. Digging deep wells. Some of you need to pick up your shovels and get to work. I believe God very specifically gave me this message for our church, for this body. Not to be satisfied with this little tiny hole that you started, but to dig deep, to put in the work. And when it gets hard, keep working. And when you hit some rocks, lay aside every sin, every weight, and keep digging and keep your eyes on Jesus. Not gonna be afraid of the work. We're not gonna be afraid of opposition. Not gonna be afraid of what others think. We're not gonna be afraid of what others say. We're not gonna be afraid of man's opinion because on that day when we stand before God, it'll just be he and I. No one else there, no one to blame and no one else's opinion matters. No, not afraid of opposition, not gonna quit. We're gonna dig deep. Dig deep for your marriage. Dig deep for your children. Dig deep for your grandchildren. Dig deep for your faith. Dig deep to build the kind of faith that your life can stand upon. And as we dig, God is working, God is moving, God is blessing. He is faithful, the word tells us he will never leave us or forsake us. So if you feel like you've been digging all alone and you keep hitting the same rock, know that you're not alone this morning. Jesus is with you. Keep digging, keep digging. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? <coughs> I'll ask our altar team to come and we're going to close as we usually do. The team will come and sing a song. I'll give you an opportunity to respond if you're here this morning and you need prayer. I want to give you that opportunity to receive prayer. And what I want you to know and what I want you to hear this morning simply is this. God is with you. When it's hard, God is with you. 
when you want to quit, God is with you. When others are pressuring you and pushing you away, God is with you. God is building your character. Endurance, perseverance. Do not throw in the towel. Just give God another chance. Keep trusting in him. Keep pressing into him. I feel like there's some people here. There might be some young people here today. And you're just ready to give up. And I want you to know there's a God in heaven who says you are valuable and you are wonderful and he has a plan for you. Do not quit. Do not give up. Do not throw in the towel. Even when it's hard, even when there's opposition, God is with us. We keep our eyes on Jesus. We trust in him. I'm praying for that one this morning that's ready to quit. Maybe quit living. I'm praying for that that couple this morning that's ready to throw in the towel after years of marriage that they just want to give up. It's too hard, and it it is hard, and it takes two. I'm praying for, for that parent, that grandparent, who's just done, done with their kids, done with their adult children. God is calling us to keep digging to that one who's ready to walk away from the faith who's ready to just be done with it all because the cost is too high. Endurance, perseverance. Would you stand together with me this morning? I want to pray over you. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and thank you that you never leave us or forsake us. And God, even when it's difficult, even when it's hard, Lord, even when we feel Hopeless. Your word says that the tribulation gives way to perseverance, gives way to character, and it gives us hope. God, I pray this morning in this body of believers for that hopeless one. Lord, that you would restore hope for that hopeless marriage, that you would restore hope for that hopeless, hopeless diagnosis. God, that you would restore hope as we lay aside every sin and we keep our eyes on Jesus. Father, I pray this morning for endurance. I pray that we would not be afraid of the hard work of digging deep wells, digging them again, even in the face of opposition. Not going to quit. Not going to throw in the towel. Going to keep our eyes on you. Lord, I pray for that one who is struggling today. Let them feel your grace and your peace and your presence. Lord, for that family that is going through a season, Lord, let them feel the power of your presence. And Lord, I pray this morning we would be reminded in the end, it will all be worth it. Every labor of love, every tear, every hardship and trial, every time we persevere, God, in the end, it will be worth it because you are with us and you are waiting for us. You've prepared a place for us. Lord, I pray for your children today. Strength, God, and hope and peace that only you can provide. We ask it in Jesus' mighty name. If you're here this morning, you need prayer, you need to spend some time with God, you need one of these great people to pray with you, I encourage you to come. Let's respond to God as we close this morning. It's your breath in our lungs So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lives, so we pour out our praise to you only, it's your breath.
shout your praise Our hearts will cry These bones will sing hope is found as we go back to the grind day after day and surrender. Father, I pray that we would keep our eyes and our focus on you. We love you and we worship you in this place in your name. Amen. Have a blessed week, church.